Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate, sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Hello, I'm Kevin Kelton, and as always, I'm along with Greg Matusak. Hi, Kevin. I'm doing what every good American should be doing for Memorial Day weekend. I'm watching the first eight Fast and Furious movies, and (laughs) Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw, but notice I'm stopping at eight. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But yes, uh, I think I can't think of anything more than uh, more American and, you know, uh, supporting our troops and the the sacrifices than Vin Diesel saying stuff like, uh, I live my life a quarter mile at the time. And, you know, (laughs) I'm tearing thinking about it. And that's our show. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, no. uh, Also here tonight is Ward Anderson. Oh, hello. Good to be here again on... <clears throat> Always a pleasure, gentlemen, to be joining you. You got to clear your throat before you come on the air. It doesn't sound like you before you clear your throat. You Sorry gotta stop swallowing that. little Sorry. ladies. <laughs> Sorry, I know, I know. The that Wally my... Cox of the More Perfect Union podcast. I was. There was more the uh, more the Jerry Lewis. Like, see, I did the uh, I, I did the Jerry Lewis uh, on film, and then Jerry Lewis in real life immediately after. The the buddy love, you could say. The buddy love. <laughs> <laughs> and who doesn't think of Ward Anderson as a modern-day buddy love? Really. <laughs> and with us tonight again is Lily Q, comedian and actress, and also now producer of her own sketch comedy series to be. Right, Lily? Yes. Hi. And hi. it's pronounced Koo. Oh, I just said Q. Sorry. Koo. No like worries. cool. Like cool. But we did want to start by uh, mentioning Memorial Day. Uh, Obviously, this is a day where we all come together, and somehow America does come together as one to commemorate and celebrate the sacrifices of those who've given their, um, what is the great, the last great measure of devotion for this country. Guys, do you have any particular plans? Now, we're taping this the day before Memorial Day, but do you have any uh, great plans for Memorial Day itself? Um, you know, I have, I've have family that served military and, you know, I was very fortunate. Uh, I've mentioned my brother. Uh, he actually did two tours, uh, in Iraq and he was lucky he survived. Um, and like I said, I'm proud of him, but Memorial Day is for those who didn't survive. Um, but, uh, I'm actually doing what a lot of Americans are doing. I'm taking the day off. I'm spending it with my family. I'll probably do some cookout type things like that. And I will be thinking about, uh, you know, American type stuff, uh, the things that make this country great. Um, I will probably force my kids to watch some sort of terrible movie from like the eighties. Like maybe I will show them saving private Ryan. They're old enough now. Um, and once again, Vin Diesel is in it. So I'm going, (laughs) I'm not kidding about that. How did Vin Diesel become like the the symbol of American patriotism? I don't quite get that. Not any everything from (laughs) Iron Giant to Groot to Saving Private Ryan. Come on, Saving Private Ryan. That I was he in that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Ward. uh, Now you're in Canada. You guys had your Memorial Day last week, right? Yeah, it was Victoria Day last week. Uh, So this Memorial Day, I will be working. Because it's just Monday here now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we wanted to start by uh, doing a recap of uh, the current events of the week past. Uh, the GOP, with the help of people like Kristen Cinema, who didn't show up to vote, blocked or at least did not make possible a bipartisan congressional commission on the events of January 6th, 2021. 11 senators did not even show up to vote. I think that was the surprising takeaway to a lot of uh, people like us who, you know, weren't in Washington that day. Uh, I suppose a few of them felt, well, um, either our side is going to win anyways or our side is going to lose anyways, and I have something else that's more pressing. I think in one case, there was a funeral or some other urgent family matter that popped up. But where do we go when we can't even get more than 53 or 54 votes for a bipartisan commission to study an attack on the country? So the thing that really kind of just shocking was that uh, Officer Brian Sicknick, who 
was the officer who was killed um, during the insurrection on January 6th. His mother went down the halls of the Senate door to door saying, this needs to be looked at. This this was terrible. My son was killed and looked at senators in the eye and said, please, you have to vote for them. And they looked at this woman and said, I can't say if I will or not, or I'm taking the weekend off. And that is amazing to me. That is amazing that you have a party that swears up and down about their allegiance to the blue, that they are, you know, we back the blue, and then they will walk away from something like that. You know, that they held 33 congressional um, hearings over Benghazi, okay, which four people died, and that was terrible. I agree. But when when we have police officers, we had 140 police officers get injured that day, okay, in terrible ways, um, on American soil at the Capitol. We haven't had something like this happen since 1812. And they were like, oh, I think it's time to go home early. Three day, four day weekend. That's yeah, they crazy. all came up with, they all had some excuse and and each one seemed to be different. I saw some senator this morning on one of the talk shows. I don't even know who I was looking at. But he was saying, well, you know, I used to be in the Justice Department. And, you know, we have a federal criminal investigation. And sometimes these congressional investigations, they can get in the way of the criminal investigation. And we don't want to do that. You know, it's, no. oh, come on. So the thing that I find really interesting, and I think it was um, Senator Kennedy from uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. I think he was talking about it, is that this was the Republicans' best deal, by far. Okay, this was going to be bipartisan, and the, and the Democrats had given them all sorts of whistles and bells. They were getting timed. It was only going to be, like, one month. Um, they were going to get, like, equal time to tell their sad story, like, Maybe they were tourists. You know, they were going to have a clear shot at being pretty fair, right? But now that's out. Although Mitch McConnell has asked, has said, like, let's do this vote one more time just to waste time, probably. But if this doesn't go that way, it's going to be like horrible for the Republicans. I mean, like bad, bad. If Pelosi has her way or Biden has his way. Well, yeah. Now, let's talk about that because there's a couple of options here. Now, people have already heard that Nancy Pelosi does have the power to appoint a House panel to investigate the events of that day. And there's nothing that stops her from appointing Republicans as well as Democrats. And, you know, she could certainly find eight or 10 or 12 House Republicans People who've come out and said, you know, this was an attack on America, uh, who would probably vote for, you know, probably agree to serve on the commission. The other possibility, which is something I haven't really seen mentioned in the media, I'm the only one who seems to be trumpeting this, is that any president can appoint his own presidential commission. Uh, famously, the Warren Commission uh, was a uh, a commission created by LBJ to study the Kennedy assassination. And that was a bipartisan commission headed by Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time. Um, but there have been numerous presidential commissions, over 40 of them, just in the 19th and 20th centuries. So there's nothing stopping Joe Biden from appointing a commission of very well-respected ex-politicians, from both parties and some of the people he could reach out to. I'm sorry, I'm making a little speech here. Some of the people he could reach out to include John Kasich, Meg Whitman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jeff Flake, and I could go down the list, Christine Todd Whitman. There are so many highly, highly respected Republicans, not necessarily in office now, Chris Christie who would probably jump at the chance to serve on that commission, along with Democrats. Ward, what do you think? I agree. And the other thing about this, it's just like Greg said, you know, it, this is their chance. This is was Republicans' chance for 
something they could really at least have a little control in, right? But, you know, now that's off the table. But then on top of that, people are also forgetting that this is still being investigated by the Department of Justice. Republicans don't have any control over that. Like, this is still being investigated. People can can and are still being prosecuted for it, right? So there's, you know, it doesn't just end because of this. You know, it used to be in this country, people said, the election cycle, you know, every presidential election starts too early. It starts a year and a half before the election. Then it became, it starts two years before the election. And 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 back, you know, it's quaint now to think that the midterms really weren't that national a thing. It was more like you were choosing your own local representatives or your state representatives. Now, we live in a constant 20, I mean, you know, 365 days a year, every year, is campaign season. And nothing can be for the good of the country. Everything has to be weighed against what our prospects are in the next set of elections. Well, and it, the thing that kills me about all that is it really doesn't need to be that way. It really does not need to be that way. I remember laughing about how impossible it would be for Trump to win, right? Months before the election, then he wins, right? But I remember then it was like six months later, people were already going, I I don't think the Democrats have anybody that can beat Trump in 2020. <laughs> and I was going, this just fucking happened. Like, like this just happened. Trump just won six months ago in a fluke. And all of a sudden it was, oh, no one will ever beat this guy when it comes down to reelection. Right. And sure enough, it was, we did this for years with, oh, who's going to beat him? Who could possibly blah, 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 blah. And then what does it all come down to? It comes down to the year, the year of the election, you know, but it's, it's four years of talking about it and it's not necessary. But yeah, it's those sort of things that make us all of a sudden speculate like, oh, Sure, you're absolutely right. But the 24 new new cycle is definitely killing. Well, I can't say it's the only thing. Trust me. See, this is not. why this is one thing that's wonderful about life in Canada. By law, the campaign season is only 30 days. That's, that's awesome. it. Right now, they oh, they I'm moving there. They extended there. it. They extended it in the last election cycle to like 90 days, and that was considered too long. I do think that um, not blocking it sends a message to people about how they plan to handle security breaches that cause deaths of not only civilians, but government workers as well. Yeah. And the other news that oh, came wait, out can this Can I add week? one more thing before that you say? Sure. That? So, so there, were, um, there were six Republicans who did vote for it who did vote for the uh, committee to go forward. Okay. A and one of them was Ohio Senator Rob Portman, my Senator Rob Portman, who I have referred to on the show as a whore and a son of a bitch and a jackass. Probably not in that order. He still is all of those things. But I have to give credit where credit is due. He did the right thing today or Friday. So good for him. Um, I'm still glad he's retiring. I still think he's the son of a bitch um, for many of his other votes, but I'm glad he did the right thing, and I hope he gets to sleep a little bit better, um, but uh, we'll have to see. Okay. And I think we just need to also remember that uh, Republicans don't like to say it, but we know that many, many, many of them were okay with the insurrection. They were all right with it. They think that it wasn't an attack on the country. They think, hey, good. Big government scared. Ugh. There are many of them who think that. Yeah, I'll take it one step further. A lot of them think it was an attack on the government, and they're okay with that. And they want they, – they, they, yeah. they hope it's just a precursor of bigger and more violent and more successful attacks. Yeah. And so there's a lot of looking in the camera and going, ah, you know, I don't, I don't agree. I, I don't blah. But secretly, yeah, they're cool with it. Yep. Yep. So, uh, Joe Biden, uh, introduced his, uh, first 
annual budget this week. It's a $6 trillion budget for the nation. Now, to put that in, in context, generally over the last decade or so, the national expenditures for the country were in the $3 trillion range. Biden is doubling that for the next budget. Now, every presidential budget, as Greg, you said earlier before the podcast started, we were talking about this, is truly a wish list. It's kind of like a roadmap of what somebody's priorities and goals are for the country. But still, it says a lot when your wish list includes doubling the national debt. Um, I I love this wish list. <laughs> there's all sorts of really cool things in it. And, you know, I mean, there's not a chance in hell that, I mean, this is the wish list that I gave to my parents when I was seven. I was like, well, yes, I do want the Star Wars Death Star. And I want the G.I. Joe Battle Fleet because, you know, that will fit in our house, which it wouldn't. And I was pleasantly surprised that I got two action figures. Um, <laughs> and that's fine. And that's what we probably will get. But like you said, this sets the tone. This sets the ambition. And it sets kind of, like you said, the priority. Infrastructure is one of the things that he keeps harping on. Um I don't think we're going to get an infrastructure bill through this Senate, at least not until the um, filibuster is gone. But one of the things he, he asks for in this is he's, he asked for $421 million for state and local grant programs that include efforts by states, wait for it, to craft gun licensing laws. Licensing laws. Licensing yes. laws. Okay, well, you can say it for me because I can't. Um, <laughs> but that's awesome. A concept that almost, uh, it's like, I think the last polling was well into 70 to 80%. I mean, we all need driver's license. I mean, a license um, or even um, better idea of who has guns and when they're buying them is such an, a, a, a federal that is such a great, concept and there's money for it awesome yeah yeah that ain't gonna be in the final that's not there's no way Um, it's 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 just too well thought out yes too well thought out so i guess my question well first of all lily i'm just curious like do you do you think about things like is the budget too rich are we spending too much money do you think about the national debt and the deficit or are you more just um what's the word i'm looking for more focused on the goal of, you know, doing something in healthcare, doing something in education, doing something in civil rights, as opposed to the, the, the price tags. So my generation is obsessed with Bernie Sanders for a reason. Um, especially He's hot. As- <laughs> He's a sexy mofo. That's why. So-, <laughs> so aside from his dashing and charming good looks, um, mm-hmm. As as a low income millennial, I come from a generation where we are so used to being in survival mode because we are so used to being in a system where we are trying to pay off our student loans. We are being held back by our credit and the crediting system. So we're at a place now where I don't think that the government being in debt <laughs> is a high priority on our list of worries compared to us individually getting out of our survival mode. So if the government getting into more debt means that we individually are going to be getting out of survival mode, I think that, um, it's that's a good trade off. Be... <laughs> yeah. Because when you have somebody who, who's been used to having broken legs for so long <laughs> and you're, and you're telling us, you know, Hey, we, we're in a situation where, you know, the people up in the sky, <laughs> you know, they're going to get you some casts here. But that means that the people in the sky, you know, they might be broke for a while. You think <laughs> that we're going to uh, going to be crying about it? <laughs> so, okay. so our priorities aren't really for the people in the sky right now. Okay. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I do, I would, I do want to know, I would like to understand, you know, that I do understand that there could be bigger consequences and I would like to understand them because even though maybe I'll get a cast once my leg is fixed, maybe 
it will come back to me or maybe there are bigger consequences in the long run that are of dire consequence to everyone else on a bigger spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I am someone who is concerned about the cost of a program like this. Now, again, I don't think that there's a chance in hell that a $6 trillion budget or even a 5 or a $4 trillion budget will – well, maybe a $4 trillion might might be passed, but not, not much more than that. I think it sends a, a bad message that the GOP will capitalize on in the 2022 and the 2024 elections, which is, there you go, we told you, elect Democrats – It's going to be spend, 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 tax, 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 spend, 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 tax, tax, tax. Now, since this budget probably doesn't have a prayer of being passed in any form resembling what it is now, why propose it just to make a kind of a symbolic showing of all the things you care about when that is going to be, to use a metaphor, that gun is going to be turned around and used against the Democrats in a year and a half? Okay, two things. One, because all those things that you care about are the things that people care about, okay? And when the polls, and I love talking about the polls, agree that 75% people want more money spent on infrastructure. Uh, and as far, and I was going to mention this to Lily, the Biden budget dropped student debt forgiveness, by the way. It dropped out of it. Yeah. Dropped out of it. Sorry, young people. But that was only due to the fact that they're waiting on a report to see if that could be done through an executive order or whether it has to be done through Congress. So that report is coming. So he hasn't forgot young people totally. Okay. Well, I wish I had your optimistic uh, point of view about the American public. I'm somewhat more cynical. and I, <laughs> Frankly, I'm not sure that the American public really cares about infrastructure. You know, if you say to them, oh, the bridges are crumbling, the buildings, the roads, we need more work. In the abstract, people go, yeah, I guess that's a good thing. But as soon as you put a price tag on it, I'll bet you that the the polling starts to shift negative. Okay, Okay. I'm living – so right now, the Grand Spent Bridge, which is huge in Kentucky and Cincinnati, uh, tens of thousands, if not more, cross it every day. It's just a huge issue. Well, it almost collapsed this year. It's been down. It is a huge infrastructure issue within Cincinnati, Kentucky, Northern Kentucky. People are have been saying like they will give like organs, limbs, uh, children that they don't particularly care for. I know my parents have called several times offering me. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is something that people love. And when they drive on the roads and they hate that, they say, where's my tax money going? They are willing to pay for that. Schools that are old and crumbling, that's what they want to spend their money on. They don't want to see it going to, why is my money going overseas? You know, they hate that. They want to see it spent here and they're willing to pay for it. And yes, I sound very idealistic. That's why my next movie, Mr. Matuzak, goes to Washington. I admire... Greg's optimism, and I share it to a point. I share it to a point. But uh, you guys are so polite today. You guys are so polite for not making fun of me. I oh, no, no, that. no, not at all. But, but, um, no, I share your optimism to a point because, yes, people do want these things, like you said. Okay. But I also agree with Kevin in the fact that, uh, infrastructure, you know what it is? It's like concert tickets. To the band that you really, really love that you didn't think was ever going to get together again. It's ABBA on tour again. It's an ABBA reunion. We all want it to happen. We all have been waiting for it. We all are there for it, right? How much are tickets? Oh, no, no, no. Fuck that. I'm not. No. I mean, I love ABBA, but I'm not. I'm not going. (laughs) That's what it is. Yeah, I, I'm going to jump on the bad metaphor uh, train here. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's I think it's a new roof. I think if you own a home, there are some people who go, you know, the roof is 15 years old. I know it's going to cost me five thousand or seven thousand or ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars, but I'm putting a new roof on the house because I know what could go wrong if I don't. Some people do that. I don't do that. (laughs) And I think most people don't do that. You wait for the leak. And I think as soon as the American people see the price tag for the new roof and for the updated sprinkler system 
and to clean out the downspouts of their home when they find out that that's going to put the country an extra trillion dollars into debt. I just don't think it's going to be as popular electorally as you guys think. Again, I have no proof. I could be wrong. I'm just telling you my opinion. Greg. Okay, two things. One, I have proof. I have polls. And I, I, I about keep my go- roof? Yes, about your roof. People have been <laughs> complaining about your roof. There's tons of Frisbees up there. Give us back our goddamn Frisbees, old man. Um, but besides that, there's tons of, tons of polls that say infrastructure is number one. Now, granted, I don't have polls about how much they're willing to spend, but there's tons of polls that they're passionate, 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 passionate about it. Is your, is your main concern the taxes that are going to go up because of this? Are you talking, are you asking me specifically? I guess, yeah, because you're the one who has the main concern about it. Okay. Yeah. So the answer is no. If I could push a button and get that budget passed into law, I would do it. My main concern is that it's not going to be the real budget. The real budget isn't going to be anything close to it. But in having a um, an aspirational budget that spends more than we know we actually will be spending, that just gives the Republicans the ammunition to say, we elected Democrats and sure enough, Spend, spend, spend. Yes, yes. Donald Trump in, expanded the national debt by an extra one and a half trillion dollars, but Joe Biden wants to expand it by an extra four trillion dollars. That's my concern. So your main concern is um, your uh, main it's... concern is is that it will deter people from voting for the Democratic Party going forward. Yes, yes. This is always, always going to be the case, though. Democrats will always ask for more money than Republicans. Right. They will always raise taxes. So they will. Republicans will always make that claim, and it yes. will always be the case. Yes, but we're, we're giving them high profile, as I say, ammunition to buttress the argument. So your point is well taken. You're right. No matter what we do, we will get called socialists. But even when we're spending money on the military and and put, pouring money into police departments, they will still say, oh, look at those socialists. They just want to spend government monies. Absolutely, you're right. I'm just concerned that it's one thing to be aspirational and to show your values, but you have to do it in a smart political way, and I'm not sure this was the smartest way. And another question I have is, because a lot of the money is going into infrastructure, where are we going to get the money to go into infrastructure if we if we don't have a budget for oh, that? Well, we we do have to borrow for it, and I think we should. And you know that that particular bill that the Biden administration put forward is is still being negotiated. As we mentioned last week, it, it was at one point a two point one or a two point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill that had a lot of other things in it aside from actual defined infrastructure. Right, and they They're dropped it down. To- Actually, there's they now chopped that down by five hundred and fifty mil, uh, billion dollars. I got to get my millions of billions straight. <laughs> um, but the, the GOP came back with a, a, an offer that was like in the nine hundred and twenty five million dollar range or nine hundred and twenty five billion billion dollar range. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't even, you know, close no, it, to the one point seven. It was less than half. It was. Yeah, it was. It was, it was about it was, it was about half and it was laughable. But again, you know, I just don't think that the Democrats have the leverage to do what we truly would like to do if we had the power to do it. So on one hand, it may it may appeal to Bernie supporters and frankly to supporters of other um, past presidential uh, candidates such as Elizabeth Warren, such as Pete Buttigieg, uh, you know, go down the list. There's probably a lot of people who like the fact that Biden is out there swinging for the fences. But if you if you strike out, (laughs) the big swing doesn't really get you anything. So I'm going to change the topic. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the covid vaccines. Lily, you mentioned to us when you were on the show past that at that time you hadn't yet gotten your vaccine because of some medical issues that you were working through. Any progress on that front? Yeah, I have an appointment for my vaccine. 
Oh, great. Hey. Yeah. So I'll be getting my vaccine soon. Pfizer vaccine. Not great, that great. I guess that matters. Oh, it's delicious. No, no. That's, that's the good flavored one. <laughs> ask for chocolate. Don't ask oh, for the cherry flavored one. That's, yeah, that's I, gross. Oh, okay. I'll make sure not to get cherry. Yeah, yeah. Say, say when and do that and see what they say when you do it. Say, I want the chocolate flavored one. So the I'll reason I sure. bring this up, Lily, we were talking about you know, when we were going down the rundown, we added something that you might not have seen in the rundown because you joined us a little bit after we started. That okay. at, a, at a hospital in Texas called Houston Methodist Hospital, which I assume is in Houston, by the way, uh, um, 117 employees of the hospital are suing their employer, suing the hospital because the hospital has a rule that to work there as a nurse, as a doctor, as a healthcare provider, you have to be vaccinated for COVID so that you can't spread it to the patients who are obviously at high risk because they're already hospital patients, right? 117 employees are suing them, claiming that the government is doing an, an experiment, a medical experiment on them that they do not consent to. And they call the, the vaccine a experimental vaccine that has not yet been fully approved by the FDA. And they're even using, I don't know whether you guys caught this in the article. They're even using a international code that was written in 1946 or 47 following the Nuremberg trials yeah. that were meant to stop people like Joseph Mengele from doing human experiments on prisoners. They're using that code as part of their rationale for why they should be allowed to work without getting the vaccine. What do you guys think of this? Okay. Well, first of all, only in Texas might it actually work. But Yay, Texas. Yay, Texas. But to be quite honest, employers are allowed to require um, vaccines um, and any type of vaccine, and especially COVID vaccines, um, as long as they comply with the ADA, the American with Disability Act, Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act, and other workplace laws. Um, so the ty- the ADA would have to say things like um, if they have a um, uh, uh, something to do with uh, like a disability or something that would interfere with them getting. The thing, if they also, if they, um, and as far as Title Seven of the Civil Rights, if they have a religious issue, those would be two reasons for them not to take it, and they could get by. But all that other stuff, that's garbage. If they would have to say that this is experimental after it's gone through all the trials, after the FDA, the CDC, they are going to get laughed out of this court. And if even if Texas allows it. Once it gets to a federal court, because this will not fly, I can't see even, I'll just say, even a Trump judge letting this go, because that will open up all sorts of horribleness. Well, okay, so I'm going to jump in, because there is a common thread uh, that this story shares with, the. I'd say the last four years, you know, for a long time, it's been a kind of a... Uh, what's the word? I'm like, not a cliche, but kind of a truism that if you have to call, once you call somebody Hitler or you call them a Nazi, you've lost the argument because there is nothing to compare to Adolf Hitler or the Nazi regime, the Third Reich. Uh, over the last four years, the, the Trump administration, many times people who were anti-Trump would compare him to Hitler, compare the Trump administration to Nazism, use general themes of that. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons why open fire politics is no longer a t- an 11,000 member uh, group, because one of my administrators was comparing the Trump administration to Joseph, to, to a quote from Joseph Goebbels, and that got us kicked off from Facebook. But here in the last couple of weeks and months, You now see the GOP, the people who were making the argument that, oh, Trump isn't isn't Adolf Hitler and and we're not Nazis and how dare you call us that. They are now going to Nazism. Of course, I'm also referring to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is comparing having to get a COVID vaccine card or proof that you were vaccinated. She's comparing that to the gold stars that Jews were infamously forced to wear 
in the ghettos of of uh, Nazi Germany. Now, now GOP lo- leadership has denounced that statement. Uh, and remember, tepidly, and remember, tepidly. Gina Carano got fired from the Star Wars show over there on Disney because of her yep. anti masking and and talking about you know com- making the Hitler comparison and stuff like that. Additionally, there is a um, there is a uh, there is a hat shop. In Nashville, did you guys see this one? There's a hat shop in Nashville called Hat Works. H A T W. I think it's W O R K S, but it might be W R K S. Anyways, they printed out uh, stars of David um, that says "Not vaccinated." Um, oh, it's that awful. they would hand it's awful. Out, that oh they handed out. Anyways, that went, of course, viral. Um, last night, um, their store was vandalized, which I do not, uh, recommend to anyone with a sign Nazis. Um, they were dropped by one of their largest, um, retailers, Stetson Hats, said, we do not wish to be associated with this hat shop. Um, and today they came out with an apology saying, I didn't realize this would be a bad thing. I did not... <laughs> Which, for two days before, they were telling people, hey, if you want to talk about a group of people who are being mistreated, you should talk about those of us who are not taking the vaccine. All of a sudden, they realize that their hat shop is going to go bankrupt, because if you want to buy a hat in Nashville, you should probably buy a Stetson. And why why else would you buy a hat? Um, (laughs) Anyways... Good for Stetson, by the way. I'm going to go out and buy a Stetson hat. So next week, when you see me on the show, I'll be looking a little taller and a little more cowboy-like. And then with that, uh, if there's nothing else to be said on that topic, let's get to the real reason that we're all meeting here tonight, which is to discuss the Friends reunion. Oh. (laughs) Am I the only person that, that forced themselves to sit through this? Did anybody else watch it? I watched about half. Yeah, I, I probably altogether watched about half. I, I went a little further, but I had skimmed through a lot of it. Um, yeah. So, boy, first of all, uh, did, did we really need? Did this add anything to the to the myth, to the allure, to the to the memory of the Friends franchise? Well, I mean, I. People have romanticized Friends for such a like. Oh, what a great show! But it's like I've the said, Ronald Reagan of television yeah. shows. But I've said yeah. for years that show did not age well. I mean, in in many ways. I mean, it was sexist. It was homophobic. I mean, the the. I mean, we we could talk about like how there many were no people, black characters. There were no black characters. <laughs> I mean, in the last season, there was one. Um, there was a girlfriend. And she was on for like maybe four episodes, maybe five. Um, listen, listen to you. You guys are describing America. <laughs> I mean, it, it did not age. This is why. Well. Neither it, has America. Right. <laughs> but I mean, we, we romanticized this like, oh, this was, this was such a great show. It wasn't. Um, America. <laughs> well, look, come on. it was a pretty good sitcom at the time. Lily, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I guess I have a I have a question since I guess I don't <clears throat> I don't know as much from a business standpoint how the industry works since I'm sort of new. So I guess from a network perspe- perspective, from a network perspective, if I know that a show has a huge beloved fan base and the main characters are willing to be recasted as these rules. The main actors are willing to be recasted in these rules. I'm probably going to want to reboot the show. So I'm asking from a financial standpoint, because as an artist, I would love to see fresh shows. I would love to, I would love to see fresh new things being done. Could it technically work as a funnel? Could they technically use money from the advertisers from these reboots and use that to fund new material? Okay. New it's a, series. That's a very interesting artists. question. First of all, just to be clear, in this particular case, and we're going to talk about reboots, but in this particular case, it was really just a retrospective. They didn't actually return as 
you know, their characters 20 years older, they we would just the actors came back and go, gee, this is sort of like a college reunion or a high school reunion. Hey, oh, do you yeah. remember when I did that little prank to you on the set between takes? Hey, remember that's that why you your arm, you know, that's why I didn't I haven't watched it. It's uh, I loved Friends, saw every episode. It was, you know, my favorite show while it was on. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still also on every day you know, somewhere besides the fact that it's on streaming, you know, it's on Netflix or whatever, but you know, it's, it's been on now forever. You know, it ran for 10 seasons, been on forever. And it was kind of like, Oh, so there's a special of them all just kind of sitting around going, remember this, remember this, remember this. I'm sure it's probably entertaining or whatever, but I don't like that didn't interest me. Now if they had done a, Hey, it's all of them now like a reunion episode in character, that would have been cool. I would have enjoyed that. Would that would have that would have right. I I would have stabbed my eyes out. I mean, <laughs> so I want to ask you guys about the choice okay. between retrospective versus reboot. But I but before we get there, Lily raised a very interesting question, and and there's an answer to it, Lily, which is studios, not so much networks, although I think it applies to both, have actually been making the case that you made for a long time. Um, when they do things like a, a reboot of an old title, The Fugitive, for instance, back in the, the late 80s or early 90s, was famously a, a movie remade from a television show. And they would argue, of course, it's not art. It's not a Martin Scorsese film. But the money that we make off of these tent poles allows us the flexibility to make the smaller, more interesting films and give newer artists a start. The same could be said in television that yes, when you have a revenue burst like this, yes, it it does allow for them to have a enough revenue to then take a chance here or there. Now, do they take those chances with the money or does it just get returned to their stockholders that I don't think any of us can really discern, but in theory, your your question is a very insightful one, and the answer is yes, in theory. In theory, <laughs> yeah. So and it now- does it does happen to some degree, you know. Um, to some degree, there are the the tent pole shows on network television that are you know. Even though the network may not own it, maybe the star of it does. He owns one of the other shows, right? And the, that is a less popular show, right? So they put it on a less popular night. So the lower ratings are blah, 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 blah. And it's funded because the other one is a big hit and produced by the same celebrity or whatever, right? So they kind of do it. Okay, so this is another (laughs) aspect of this that I wanted to ask you guys about is, and this is going to be personal preference, but do you prefer the remakes, the retrospectives, or the, you know, 20 years later takes on all of these different reboot to remakes? For instance, Mad About You went a different way, same era. Uh, now, now, Friends had the incredible good fortune that mostly all of the main char- i mean, all of the main characters and most of the people associated with it are still around, and they could have done, you know, pick up their lives twenty years later, see where the marriages were, see where the careers were, see where the relationships were. Mad about you went that way. They updated the series with Paul and Jamie Buckman as the parents of a college student, again, 18 years after we had last seen them in the original series. Um, Sort of a a girl meets world, but five years later, girl meets world famously took the boy meets world characters, uh, Corey and Topanga, updated them now as married parents of a, I think, 13 or 14 year old girl and her friend. And it became a series about them being the parents of somebody in high school. Uh, whereas Night Court, which we've talked about here, they're famously doing a reboot, but Harry Anderson is no longer around. 
uh, several of the other characters are still alive, but they're only bringing back Dan Fielding into the series, but they're still calling it Night Court, which to me is sort of like saying, well, we'd like to remake Larry Sanders, but we no longer have Gary Shandling. We no longer have Rip Torn, who played the, the producer, but we still have Hank Kingsley. So let's do the Larry Sanders reboot and just make it about Hank Kingsley. <laughs> to me, both <laughs> both are kind of crazy. Yeah. But I'm just curious what you guys think about this. All right. I think I think they're all terrible. I think they're all terrible. And I'll and I'll go real quick one by one. One, the retrospectives where you have a group of actors. I guess that's interesting to a certain degree, as long as it's not 90 minutes. Um it's kind of fun, but I'd rather watch the um remember when DVDs you could listen to the tracks? Um, yeah, what, yeah. what did you what did you call it? The director's, the director's track. The director's cut or yeah, the director's Love track. that. And if, yeah. if if the if they would get back and say, Oh, okay, and this scene, he's going to pick up a Diet Coke. It it wasn't supposed to be there. That's ad libbing, the magic of acting. Go back to that. That was so much fun. Um the 20 years later is terrible. There's not one good one. And and the worst part is the story is supposed to stop. It's our imagination. Uh, Sopranos, for example. Remember how it just cuts to black and we don't know. Oh, by the way, that's a spoiler. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you haven't seen what happens at the end of Sopranos, that's on you. It cuts to black and you don't know if that man that enters kills them or if um, if uh, what's her name actually parked the car because she's terrible um, or if if he, if they just ate dinner and the next day he just gets into the same old shit. Um, right. And that's the whole point of this thing was it's up to you, the the watcher. You're, the, the story goes on in your head. I love fan fiction for that reason alone. Um, and all of a sudden they take it away from you. Like, no, you're wrong, the watcher. It's ours now. Um, the Gilmore Girls re, uh, reunion was terrible. It was called A Year in the Life. So poorly written so forced um and then finally the reboot like the 90120 one yeah. or or the um 90210 yeah yeah 90210 and then there was another saved by the bell all right. of these are so piss poor it's it's like uh it's like someone putting on the corpse of a, of a, and say look at me i'm not a dead body it's so morbid to watch these shows try to be something they're not when we live in the golden age of television and there's great ideas out there and i'm watching something sad you know um so yeah that's all three terrible ideas and i feel strong about it my optimism and hope is gone on this stuff <laughs> okay lily what did you have to say I love what Greg said about how how our imagination. Yes, I love that. Uh, I love Thanks. how we said that. Um, that was well well stated. I, it's and, not the first time I've had to state that. By the way, I, I've actually <laughs> I've actually been thrown out of several bars when I see TVs. I'm like, turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you said that. I think you stated it really well. Well, thank Good. you. Ward, final thoughts on this. I love them. All of them. God damn Give it, me Lord. more of them. It's the monkeys reboot. I love right? them. Oh, do you remember Absolutely. the monkeys reboot? Do you they only had yes. one song? Um, I'm not crazy. New okay. The First new of monkeys all, reboot. There was uh the there was a band called New Monkeys, and they had a 13 episode yeah. first and only season. I do not and recall. And I this. have their and I have their album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not buy their album. I had their I had their cassette. I'm not crazy. I, I'm just I have a the little. Album. Yeah, yeah. They had one hit that they just kept doing like acoustic for oh so bad. Lily? No, no. They didn't have one hit. They had a full album. Yeah, but they had only one single that they released. Often. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, I love all this reboot stuff. I'm telling you, do it. I love it. It's great. I think it's great. I enjoy oh. catching up with people, you know, that, that, but I like it when they do the whole, like, Oh, it's been 10 years. It's been 20 years. Now, some of them have sucked the Murphy Brown one. I couldn't even get through right. one episode of the Murphy Brown one, but I don't care. I, I, I love it. But I, but when it's them sitting around like the reunion thing, that that's not as interesting to me, but, uh, I That's do about like, their uh, lives, not about us. Yeah. Lily, what were you going to yeah. say? 
and reboots and and reboots i love reboots come on buffy the vampire slayer the tv series is actually a reboot of a not good movie right that doesn't count count. that's a tv adaptation Mm -hmm. lily (laughs) there's two things i want to say before i forget um (laughs) one one thing is there's nothing that um removes my ability to suspend my disbelief then when either one there's an actor that is very important that is missing from the series in the reboot and two i think that i would hate watching the same shows as ward but i would love hanging out with greg and watching the same <laughs> shows as greg i think me and greg have the same taste but Heck me yeah. and Ward do not. Heck well, yeah. I feel like I feel like the host of the dating uh-huh. game now. So I'm going to get the two of you on a plane to, to <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> I, 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 I think the biggest crime in television, and this is probably where I lose Lily here, was Firefly. OK, Firefly was Firefly was canceled after 14 episodes. One of the best cast, one of the best stories, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it was fired because. They thought that they could hold out for better money and they would bluff the system. And, and they were like, OK, well, you want more money? We don't have it. Goodbye. It was just a tragedy. If you said tomorrow that they would go and do like pick up where they left off, same cast, I would say I don't want it. Nope, never. And they did make a movie. Still don't want it. Still don't want to know where they're going. In my head, they've got these great adventures. Um, I've got several volumes of fan fiction I've written, and all of it's clean. For those of you people going where you wanted. I like reboots so much. I want a sitcom about the dog from Frasier living in dog heaven. (laughs) No, that dog is in dog hell. Well, let me invite you guys right now. 20 years from now, I've already booked it. The More Perfect Union reunion. And we're all going to be there. And we're going to look around and go, wow, okay. I thought the Zoom was somehow bigger than it looks here. I there, just... is, <laughs> there is something I would watch a reboot of. <laughs> yeah. Almost any animated comedy that I like, including The Simpsons and Rick and Morty. The Simpsons are still it, it on, be, though. It would be so weird, right? But if any of them uh, stopped and there was a significant period of time, I would totally watch a reboot of an animated comedy because it would just be so weird. I'm trying to think of an anime. Like, like they did the and- Samurai Jack reboot, which was excellent. And they're, they're actually doing a Powerpuff Girls uh, live action film. Um, no way. I have yeah, to- yeah. And, Are and, the Powerpuff and the Power- Girls all still alive? See, yeah, me and Greg Puff- are on the same page. Yeah, Powerpuff Girls Greg. in this one are like... Now, older, I just want like I, I, I just want to point out that now Lily likes reboots. Yeah, yeah a little while ago you were against comedies. them. If okay. they are animated comedies, I have my... She was against it, but no, it was, but, hey... <laughs> an animated <laughs> reboot, that's fair enough. That's I'd fair. like to, yeah, I'd like to see, like, yeah. you know, bring the Flintstones back and you have, you know... Whoever supposedly played Fred Flintstone walking around going, yeah, the cave. I remember it being somehow bigger. Hey, hey, yes. hey, wait, yes. wait, hold on, hold on. No, that's, that is in the works right now. That is what being made yes. right now. There's is- a Flintstone. Oh, um, God, it's going to bug me now. Elizabeth Banks. Can you, can you look it up for me, Greg? I don't have access to it. The, okay, um, I'm looking it up. Hold on. They're doing a they're doing a Flintstones sequel animated series with See, I, I would watch that grown with a grown adult adult pebbles. animated comedy sequel. There it is. Yes. Shit. Okay. Well, Bedrock. I guess. There oh, it yeah, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. There it is. Yeah, Let's yeah, see. Yeah. The network is developing, the Fox network is developing a primetime animated adult comedy series uh, with the Charlie's Angels and Hunger Games star, Elizabeth Banks, uh, set to voice Pebbles Flintstone in addition to producing. And Banks I will has been watch developing that. this. And you would watch this. Okay? Yeah, I'll and probably watch, watch the that. shit out of that too. All and, right. I, mean, so. I just want to point out we are, that I just, we are TV bros. Yeah, I just I want to point that. out that clearly everyone loves reboots and remakes. 
<laughs> Despite what everybody said at the beginning of this. God damn it. All right, you got uh, me, yeah. Lord. You got me, You see, it. and I thought, oh, that I, was being, I, I thought I was being cynical and sarcastic when I mentioned the Flintstones. Who knew it was in the nope. works? It's really in the works. You had really me at Elizabeth Banks. I mean, yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we've gone very long, so I'm going to just do a quick wrap up and say thanks for listening. If you enjoy what we do here, please follow us on Twitter at MPU Podcast and on Instagram at MPU Fan Club. And please check out our new and improved homepage design for the More Perfect Union podcast. The website is MPUPodcast.com. That's MPU standing for More Perfect Union, MPUPodcast.com. And please go check out our, our uh, design there. Uh, check out the bios for the hosts and let us know uh, of, of all the new hosts that we've been bringing on, including Lily and Sue Kalinsky and Robin Rosenfeld and Emily Galati and a few others, uh, Larry XL. Please let us know who you're digging, who you'd like <laughs> to hear more of. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It just sounded like you said hose, not hosts. Oh no! This is the second time I've but I've insulted somebody on the podcast today. Okay, so you're like, so you're like Bring tell us about for more you know, union. You're like, you're like, tell us what you think you about some your, of the hoes we've had. Like, perfect, like, you get your gang signs. Oh, you're gonna kill you, me on Twitter, Ward. You're gonna kill me. And then all you did was you. You're like, tell us about the hoes that we've had. Like, <laughs> and then you named, and then Five you named women. nothing but women, Five women, and Larry XL. <laughs> And then I went, what the? <laughs> right, and it wasn't until right. you said Larry that I went, oh, he said hosts. Okay. Now oh, this gosh. makes sense that I don't think he's just being awful. Well, this is probably my last podcast for the More Perfect Union, but thank you for letting <laughs> me sit in with you guys. It's been a pleasure. I understand the times change, people change. And uh, I'm now like the Al Franken. <laughs> of the more perfect human podcast. <laughs> <laughs>